to talk about both those GDP numbers and what's come out of the party congress. We're joined by Arthur Dong, teaching professor at the McDonald's School of Business at Georgetown University. Good to see you. Um, welcome back. Let me start with these. Thanks, Phil, for having me on. Let me start with these GDP numbers, 3.9 percent. Um, I will say some experts are saying that that's quite impressive given the rolling lockdowns uh, that we saw in the last three to six months in China. Your thoughts? Yes, Phil. That's a, just as you previously indicated, the uh, third quarter GDP report came in at 3.9. Consensus was at a low 3.4, so they beat expectations by a small amount. But I dare say that uh, in terms of the momentum overall for China ending up to, in 2022, I dare say that we are reaching uh, a 40-year low with regard to China's uh, you know, historical growth level. If you've been watching the, the media, you know, from CNBC to Bloomberg, everyone's talking about the CPC, right, and what what occurred there, the third term essentially for President Xi. And there is questions and there's a lot of guessing going on. If we could bring some clarity as to what the market forces are going to be over the next three, four, five years, what would you tell people? Well, China is facing a number of challenges, both internally as well as externally. On the internal side, uh, right now, as a result of the 12 successive months of real estate decline, uh, it is a uh, it is a investment that many Chinese families have heavily invested in. So therefore, the wealth effect and the impact on the average Chinese family is being felt. And as a result, uh, they are sort of holding on to their wallets and spending a lot less as a result of caution. So internally, there are a number of challenges. Uh, you know, China has grown in this last quarter as a result of doubling down on infrastructure and capital spending. And it's a recipe that they have relied on in the past. But there's only so far that that can go without reaching debt limits as well. And so as a result of this, we're seeing, you know, consumption sort of waning within the Chinese economy, the real estate sector suffering a month after month of declines and further challenges, the rising, uh, I mean, the falling value of the yuan is also having an impact on the Chinese economy. And externally, you know, we're still embroiled in a major conflict in Ukraine. We have geopolitical tensions throughout East Asia and other parts of the world. Right. We have an oil and energy shock. And we now have a retreating uh, American consumer as a result of the American consumer being battered by 8.2 percent inflation. Right. So, so d different parts of the world obviously have different challenges that they're facing. But I do see one common denominator. We see housing prices fall in Western Europe. We see housing prices um, starting to fall here in the U.S. And in China, they, they've been struggling with housing prices as well. Maybe, maybe this is the byproduct, if you will, or the aftermath of all this easy money that's been floating around for the past four or five years. And this is a natural prog progression of the economic cycle. And it may not be anyone's fault necessarily, but something that just has to happen if you want things to be good in the long run. It, it, is that a possibility? Yeah, absolutely, Phil. I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, the cost of capital has been trending towards zero for the better part of the last 10 years. And so, you know, economies all over the world experienced, you know, super uh, abundance of cheap capital thereby inflating real estate prices all over the board. And now we're starting to see, you know, those chickens come home to roost as the cost of capital has, has in a sense, doubled. And now mortgage interest rates are starting to, you know, uh, you know, return to normal rates. And so as a result, you're seeing a downturn in the real estate market, both in the United States, Western Europe, and now China. And so perhaps this is the equilibrium and the balance that is needed to restore some semblance of normalcy into these asset markets. Nobody anticipated this conflict in Ukraine to be dragged out to the extent that it, it has been dragged out to. And in fact, even to this day, we don't know if things are going to escalate and be worse or there will be a somewhat amicable conclusion to any of this. We just don't know that. And to me, that's also a big elephant in the room, that how can countries like China or the U.S. or any country, for that matter, that relies on this important supply chain plan for the future? Uh, we can't just ignore what's happening. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, well-informed uh, 
uh, CEOs as well as governmental leaders are trying to risk map the various scenarios uh, that are they're facing with regard to this, you know, ongoing conflict in Ukraine. It can go any number of ways, and if you fail to actually, you know, put the pen to paper and start to risk map the various scenarios that you're confronted with, I think you're going to be in a in a world of trouble uh, without preparing for either the worst case scenario or the best case scenario. Yeah, a lot of questions. We don't have answers. Uh, as to it yet. I guess we all just hope things stabilize for a bit so we can catch our thoughts. Um, Arthur, I could keep going on this topic for a couple hours, but um, I'm sure Nellis wouldn't let me do that. So I want to say thank you to you, and we're going to have you back to talk more on this uh, important topic. Thank you. Thank you.